Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for attending my first ever online webinar. Super proud of this. Um, I'm really excited to present this information to you guys. This information has been super, super helpful for me. And I'm really excited and happy that you're here. So thank you so much. Um, this is Time Mapping to Defeat Distraction and Obliterate Overwhelm. And my name is Lola. Most of you um, probably know me. Um, we're probably friends or we've done yoga together or you're one of my students. <clears throat> so thank you so much for spending this time with me. So today, just a little, um, just an agenda of what we're going to do on this webinar today. <clears throat> I'm going to give you a brief introduction about myself and how I came to um, teach on this topic. And what I want to point out about this slide here that's so ironic is that this extremely well-known painting on the right here by Salvador Dali is named the persistence of memory. And why it's ironic is because now that 77% of Americans own smartphones, our ability to remember anything <laughs> is um, not persistent, right? Or our ability to remember is anything but persistent. So even though this painting is called the persistence of memory, our memories these days aren't very persisting persistent. In fact, they're kind of fleeting. Our short-term memory is really, really taking a hit from our multitasking ways. And we're going to talk about that uh, coming up soon. Um, as you see there, your brain on multitasking. Uh, Stanford Memory Lab found that multitasking isn't just making us feel overwhelmed, but it's also handicapping our ability to remember. That is um, something that you may have already experienced. I know I definitely have. And um, excuse the sounds outside. I do live in New York City, so <laughs> it's pretty noisy here. So anyway, um, multitasking, your brain on multitasking, and that multitasking is making it hard for us to remember. We're going to get into why and how that affects our ability to stay on task. When we get to the time mapping section, I'm going to teach you two methods for time mapping, what I like to call the bucket method, and then weekly plans. I'm going to teach you the scales method for prioritization. I'm going to show you how to trim your to-do list by picking three priorities, which right now might sound absolutely insane. Like, how am I supposed to pick three? Um, by the time we get to that topic, we'll have already covered a lot of methods for helping us decide what's really important. Then I'm going to teach you some mindset, mindset shifts for defeating distraction. Distraction is going to happen. It is a given. So some some mindset shifts for what to do when that happens. And then some of my favorite tools for obliterating overwhelm. And as you can see, I love alliteration and I try to use it whenever I can because I think it's fun and it actually helps us remember when um, we, we alliterate and when we find some fun phrases to, um, that are easy for our brain to grasp. So a little bit about me. Um, as I said, my name is Lola Repan, and most of you on this webinar probably know me, um, but if you don't, this is me a few years ago. Um, I am a yoga teacher. I have been teaching yoga for over eight years, and I'm primarily a forest yoga teacher. I also teach yin yoga, bhuti yoga, alignment-oriented vinyasa, meditation, pranayama, basically anything having to do with the body-mind I'm fascinated by. And that's also why I decided to become a coach because in part, um, well, there's a good reason for it. About three months ago, I tore the meniscus of my left knee and went from having a completely chock-full teaching schedule to basically being housebound, literally. I could not walk and I definitely couldn't teach or practice yoga and I had to figure out what am I going to do when practically all of my income is from teaching yoga and working with people in the private yoga space. So uh, 
coaching, um, an opportunity to join an awesome coaching challenge came my way soon after my injury. And I needed something to help me process all of the anxiety around being injured and on losing so much of my income. So I signed up for this coaching challenge. And one thing led to another. And I decided that I was going to make this pivot to becoming a transformational coach, or I like to call it a path guide person that helps other people live the life that they most want to live. And the reason why I can teach about this is because I've been doing this for myself for the last many, many years, learning how and refining my ability to shape my life into something that is meaningful to me and is aligned with my dharma, my life purpose. And that is helping others find their life purpose and being most excited about life. So that's a little bit about me. All right, so let's get into our presentation. So if you've ever watched the Adult Swim cartoon, um, the time, um, Super Jail, then you might know these guys. These are the Time Police. And this is from episode nine of season one of Super Jail. And it's like the season finale of um, season one. And it's a two-part two part, uh, finale. And this is in the first section and the time police show up because the warden of super jail is making a time crime and the time police, they sing this song and it's going to be in the next slide. Wait, you cannot escape. Never run away from the time police. You will not survive. <laughs> So yeah, you cannot run away from the time police. You will not survive. And that is really what we're getting to in this webinar. Um, when we try to run away from the time police by multitasking, thinking that we're going to be um, more productive by doing that, we are really pulling a fast one on ourselves. So I might be dating myself a little bit, but you might remember this campaign, I guess it was in the 80s, about your brain on drugs. And it was like a hot frying pan, drop an egg in there and it sizzles. So this is actually truly more like your brain on multitasking. Multitasking is not a friendly way of treating your brain. If you lose your attention goals, you're more likely to let anything in, including goal irrelevant information. For instance, you might be trying to write a webinar, and actually this is exactly what happened to me as I was trying to write this webinar. You might be trying to write a webinar, but then a friend texts you, and after replying, you should go back to writing the webinar, but instead you check out Instagram. And then before you know it, you've been on Instagram for like 30 minutes, just completely going down a tunnel of God knows what. So multitasking and interruptions really affect our ability to stay on task. Research suggests that this wandering has all sorts of downstream effects. Uh, studies find that people who are heavy multitaskers, that means they spend a lot of time toggling between screens, totally guilty, actually do worse on tests of what researchers call working memory. Working memory is the ability to hold multiple objects of attention in your mind at once. So maybe you've heard about this acronym, WILFING, right? It stands for what was I looking for? I guess there should be another W in there, right? To make it accurate. So WILFING, what was I looking for? And WILFING happens when you stop whatever it is that you're doing to do something else, and then you have no idea what it was that you were doing before you got distracted. So this happens, this it, it happens to me less because I'm utilizing time mapping, but it has happened to me for so much of my life. And I'm sure probably everybody listening to this webinar can relate. You're doing something, <clears throat> you're writing something or you're doing some sort of task online. And then your friend texts you and you reply. And then you check, you notice that on your smartphone, there's another notification for something. And so you check that notification and then that leads you to checking another notification. And then you check your Instagram or your Facebook and then you cannot even remember what you were doing before you got distracted. 
<clears throat> who relates to this. So um, in a 2015 study, participants were asked to view a collection of illustrations of everyday objects on a screen, and then to say if any of them had moved. Heavier multitaskers, that is people who were looking at a bunch of different screens or you know, tabbing between this thing and that thing or looking at multiple screens like the one in front of you and the one in your pocket, heavy multitaskers were not only worse at identifying the right, uh, the right ones, right, the right illustrations that had moved, but they were also worse at a long-term memory task when they'd been asked to identify which of the objects they'd seen before. So the reduced long-term memory looks like it's coming from a lack of paying attention to things in the first place. Let me say that again. Reduced long-term memory appears to be coming from a lack of paying attention to things in the first place. Who can relate to this, right? Like you're, you're doing something important. Maybe you're having a conversation with your partner. Maybe you're in a meeting at work, and then you go through this whole wilfing cycle of getting distracted by something, and then you're sort of half paying attention to what it is that's supposed to be important, and then you cannot remember the content of that thing. This has happened to me so many times, I'm almost ashamed to admit it, but I realize that I know I'm not the only one, so I'm over my shame in admitting that sometimes I don't remember what my partner told me. I'm like. 10 minutes after he told me, and then I have to ask him to repeat himself. It's something that I'm really working on and trying to avoid distraction by some of these techniques that I'm going to share with you. Or something else that has happened to me is that I'm on the phone with a client and I'm getting really important information on a project that I have to complete for that client, but my phone just notified me that I got a, a like or a comment on my Instagram. <laughs> And then I, if I look at my Instagram feed to find out what somebody says, I might miss some really important information that my client is telling me about the project that I need to complete. So not only is wilfing really annoying, but it, has, it can have negative effects on our relationships and on our professional uh, performance. So the way to remember something is to show your brain that it's important. And that's done by mentally engaging with the material. So mentally engaging with the material, right? That means like actually paying attention to it instead of just sort of paying attention to it. Check this out, <coughs> excuse me. Check this out, attention is the initial phase of memory. This is so important. Attention is the initial phase of memory. So for example, like if you're paying attention to your GPS on how to get to a neighborhood, you're using your GPS right, as short-term memory instead of using the landmarks or the path that you took, like more kinesthetic memory or a visual memory to actually learn the route to get somewhere, right? So you are basically outsourcing memory to things like GPS. And if that happens, and there's many examples that we can come up with for that, if you're outsourcing your memory, or if, rather if you're outsourcing your attention to something like GPS, you're losing out on that initial phase of memory. So it's going to be harder to remember. Same thing happens with constant distraction. It's hard to remember either what we were involved in and what we're attempting to learn or what comes next when we're always being distracted. And this is known as shiny object syndrome. And I hope you noticed that even the way that I brought that into the slide, I tried to make it shiny <laughs> and like distracting, right? So shiny object syndrome, it's not just about pretty stuff. It's not just about stuff that we like to look at, like our Instagram feeds are like something shiny and pretty. But shiny object syndrome also describes an always more interesting or compelling input distracting us from whatever it is we're currently engaged with. And here are some dogs getting distracted by a squirrel, right? So we all know this feeling and 
you know, it's that you're at a, you're on a call with a client or you're with your partner or you're with your friends or something is happening and you're supposed to be there, but then you notice that you get a comment on your Instagram feed and you cannot help but press that button on your phone to see what somebody said. And then it's really hard to recover from that distraction. And it also makes it more difficult to remember what was being said or presented in that moment. So SOS or shiny object syndrome isn't the only problem, right? It's not just getting distracted, but it's also recovering from that distraction. So there's evidence that heavy multitaskers brains function differently than light multitaskers brains. And remember those heavy multitaskers are those people that have a bunch of tabs open and are scrolling from one tab to the next or are using the screen on their desktop or laptop and the screen in their pocket on their phone at the same time. Check this out. In a 2016 study, 149 teenagers and young adults were asked to say if sentences that flashed across the screen for a short period of time were congruent or not. Let me define that. So incongruent sentences were made by taking a sensible sentence and switching out the last word for something that worked grammatically, but was otherwise nonsense. Like, this morning I ate a bowl of shoes versus the congruent one, which would be like, this morning I ate a bowl of oatmeal. So heavier multitaskers did worse than their less multitasky peers on this test. Heavier multitaskers were less able to enforce boundaries, as it were, um, and, you know, enforcing boundaries on being able to stay on task and focus and not respond to that Instagram alert. <clears throat> and they also, this is really interesting, had greater activity in the prefrontal cortex of their brain. And that's the part of your brain associated with self-control, suggesting that heavy multitaskers had to exert more attentional effort in order to focus in the first place. So to combat SOS, we can ask ourselves two questions right in the moment. Like you become distracted by something. And I know that it's not practical to remember these questions <clears throat> uh, verbatim, right? But it's the process that counts. So if you find yourself being continuously distracted by shiny object syndrome, you can just ask yourself, where am I supposed to be right now? If it's at your desk or on a phone call or with your partner or teaching a yoga class or taking a yoga class, just asking yourself this question, where am I supposed to be right now, can be enough to get you back into focus on the present. And then the follow-up question is, what is the most important thing I need to do right now? So using that example of the Instagram alert, if I'm having an important conversation with my partner, and my phone is like lit up like a Christmas tree, most important thing I need to be doing is paying attention to him, not looking at my phone. So this, this is something that takes practice, right? Because it's so easy to get distracted by this computer in our pocket. And we're gonna talk a little bit more now around how to start um, cutting out some of these distractions and starting to focus our attention. And that is, with time mapping. And that's the, uh, the topic of this webinar that I feel so passionately about because it's been really helping me. So time mapping is exactly what it sounds like. You map out your time. And why this may sound totally impractical at first, and there is definitely a, a learning curve where when you first start doing this, you're like, this is actually taking more time than it's helping me save. Yes, there is that sort of uptake curve in the beginning. But once you start implementing time mapping and start getting in the habit of doing it regularly, I guarantee you it will help you save time and it will help you most importantly focus, avoid distraction, and cut down that feeling of overwhelm. So I'm going to teach you two methods of time mapping. And I promise that when this webinar is over, I'll be sending you guys the links to download some of these resources. And for time mapping, I'm going to be sending you two resources for creating a, um, an overall time map and for your weekly time mapping planning. 
All right, so let's start with buckets. So this is a technique that I learned from my coaches. And this is, I know it looks crazy. <laughs> and when I first did this, I felt like, oh my God, my life is just a complete mess. Like, how am I even going to, how am I even going to do this? How is this going to help me when my life looks like this? So that's the first step. The first step is confronting your overwhelm, right? The reality of the situation is that this is just what our lives look like. And it's only when we get it down on paper that we go, oh my God, right? But if you're not looking at this consciously, it's all happening in your subconscious. So you already know that your life is crazy and your life has so many different, sometimes often conflicting priorities and that you have a lot going on. If you don't get this out into a time map, your brain knows that you have a lot going on. And so you have subconscious or unconscious uh, anxiety and overwhelm. I think it's much more helpful to get it out on paper, look at it, confront it, and then start to work on it. So buckets are what you see here. You'll see that there's these buckets of time that I've created for myself, like sleep, dog, walk in the dog, work, self-care, eating or food, and so on. So time mapping like this is really a, um, it's a process to help you understand how you're spending your time. So the first step that you'll want to do with these um, templates that I send you for creating uh, buckets like this is to do a time map for the week that you just had. Try to recreate to the best of your ability what you did and how much time you spent doing it. It's probably going to look really crazy, a little bit like this. And actually, this is my more organized version. You would not even want to see the one that I did when I mapped out how I actually spent my time. It was a mess. So the first step is to do a time map for the week that you just had and see what that looks like. Get an idea of like how many hours are you spending doing all the various things that you're doing? Work, commuting, uh, running errands, cleaning up, walking your dog, all that good stuff. Then you create a second time up for uh, what you would like your life to look like, right? Like eight hours of sleep, half an hour of meditation, an hour of exercise, quality time with your dog, quality time with your partner, time for play, time for self-care, time to read. So your second time up is what you want your life to look like. Then the third one is a blend of your reality and your optimal time map. And that's gonna look a little bit more like this one. So even though this one still looks pretty intense, this is actually a blend of what my crazy life looked like before time mapping what I'd love to see in my life. And the result is this. So I scheduled in a couple of hours for self-care on certain days. I scheduled in hour long walks with my dog. I scheduled in eight hours of sleep and a half hour of meditation. I'd like to say that this is a general outline. You do not want to use this as a tool for beating yourself up if you don't conform to this exactly to the key. That's not the point. The point is to give yourself a goal to work towards, where you're getting your eight hours of sleep, where you're getting your half hour of meditation, where you're getting time to be with your family or your partner that is not being um, cut into by anything else. So let's call this preparation work, right? This bucketing process is kind of like a preparation for what we get to next, which is weekly planning. So this is an example <clears throat> of a daily time map that I use. It has today's date on it. Um, when I do my weekly time planning work. And I do my weekly time planning on Sunday night for the week before. So the first thing that I do, and I have a sheet that looks like this for every single day of the week, is I fill out all my obligations, all my appointments, meetings, um, I told you guys at the beginning of the webinar that I tore my meniscus three months ago. So I, I schedule in all my PT appointments. I schedule in any appointments that I have with my uh, orthopedic doctor for follow-ups. I schedule in all of my um, 
my meetings with my coach and my coaching buddy and all of that stuff. So I schedule all that stuff in first. Then in the time remaining, I fill out the rest. And I fill out the rest with what my top three priorities are for the day and for the week. And we're going to get to that shortly. How to identify your top three priorities. So this sheet, I just block it out, right? Like I get a highlighter and I just block out like from nine to 10, I'm going to do this. And from 10 to 11, I'm going to do that. And again, this is a general outline. These are not tools for beating yourself up if you don't adhere to them to the T. But when you have this out in front of you, and especially when you spend Sunday night planning out your week, you have a much greater chance of sticking to your goals that are leading to the life that you most want than if you get distracted. Some of you may have used some of the planners that have become really popular in the last few years, like the Passion Planner, and they work on this same concept where every week you map out your goals, um, you identify your priorities, and you, pri and you prioritize those. All right, so let's talk about some of the tools that we need to implement so we can actually do this time mapping thing and have it work for us. So next thing I'm gonna teach you guys is called the scales method. And the scales method is all about figuring out what are those three most important tasks that we're going to map into our time maps. So scales method is um, the first thing, first step is to set aside about 10 minutes for planning. And that's that Sunday night um, block that I have, right? Now in the beginning, it takes me, it took me a lot longer than 10 minutes. Sometimes it took me an hour to plan my week, but I felt that it was really worth it because I was that much more productive. Now I'm getting to where I can do it in about 30 minutes, but on my daily planning, that should be limited to about 10 minutes. So you wanna plan before you take action. Don't become so involved in planning that you become trapped in it and never move beyond first base. Give yourself a specific time period for planning, but keep it short, 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. This should be enough time to think about your plan. So you use this time to look at the big picture, think about your current goal and the target that you need or want to achieve, and you lay out all the tasks that you need to do. We're gonna get into this in more detail, so if it sounds a little overwhelming right now, don't worry, I'm gonna get granular with this. The next step, after you've taken that 10 minutes or so to plan it out, is to align your tasks with your goal. And this is the important component that makes the scales method effective. It works like this. Take a look at all the tasks that you're doing and review the importance of each of them. Specifically, you want to measure a task's importance by its cost and benefit. By cost, I'm referring to the effort needed to do that task, like time, money, and other resources. The benefit is how closely that task can contribute to your goal. <clears throat> to make this easier for you guys, I'm gonna list out the four combinations of um, cost and benefit and that should help you to pretty quickly determine the priority of each of your tasks. And as an example, I'm going to use um, a goal that I'm working on in my own life at this moment. And that is moving to St. Petersburg, Florida. So I'm gonna use my desire to leave New York City area to move to St. Petersburg as an example of how time mapping um, and the scales method can work in real life. So of those four categories that we talked about for the cost benefit, the first one is low cost and high benefit. Do these tasks first because they're the simple ones to complete, but they'll help you get closer to your goal. So when I knew that I wanted to leave the New York City area, I had no idea where. I had a couple of like fantasies cities in mind or fantasy locations. Like I wanted to move to Costa Rica. But the more time that I spent in Costa Rica, I knew that it really wasn't practical. There were a lot of barriers for residency. Like I had to have $60,000 saved in a bank account to get legal residency in Costa Rica. The only other option and the way a lot of other people do it is to go in on a three-month tourist visa 
hop the border every three months and then come back. And I've known a lot of people that have done this and some of them have gotten caught overstaying their visa and then they're like barred from coming back to Costa Rica for years. So I didn't, I knew that that wasn't the way I wanted to do things. I knew I didn't want to be hopping a border every three months, but I also knew that I did not have $60,000 in a bank account to get legal residency. So then I started thinking about what's some place that might be like Costa Rica that has beautiful weather that has beautiful beaches, that has palm trees, where it's sunny all the time. Actually, Costa Rica is sunny only part of the time because there's a really big, long, rainy season. And so low cost, high benefit. I started researching things like best US beaches, right? That's like a Google search that took literally three minutes. Then I researched things like um, most consistent temperature US cities. And I found a list of those types of cities. And slowly but surely, I started to narrow down my list. But all of these searches that I did to find a place to move to only took me a couple of minutes. So it was low cost, right? All I used was my laptop or my, or my phone. And it had high benefit because it started to help me narrow in on what I wanted. So using this example, I researched the cost of living in cities that I was thinking about moving to, right? After I got down to like about five cities that all had great beaches, really consistent temperature and sun a lot of the time, then I started researching the cost of living in those cities. So these are all examples of low cost, high benefit. And the next step is, or the next category is high cost and high benefit. And this is where you take a high cost task and break it into smaller ones. In other words, you break that big task into mini ones that take less than an hour to complete. And then you reevaluate those little tasks and set their correct priority level. So when I narrowed down my list of cities to a couple, right? It was St. Petersburg, Florida, San Diego, California, and Corpus Christi, Texas, because they're all sunny. <laughs> they all have great weather and um, they're basically semi-tropical. So then I had to do some of these more high cost, high benefit tasks. Once I decided that it was gonna be St. Petersburg that I was going to really research, I needed to do things that cost money, like book a ticket to get there. I had to figure out how I could get there and then commit to doing it. I had to figure out the time that I was going to go visit and how much time I needed to really um, learn about this city. So I had to plan um, time off from my various clients and, and, and uh, jobs and classes. So these took a little bit more effort, right? Like I had to plunk down that, um, you know, between the plane tickets and the car rental and the Airbnb to go research this city that I think I want to go live in, I had to put down like $2,000. So that's high cost, but it also has high benefit because I don't want to just show up in a city and know that it's not for me because I don't want to move like every couple of years. I'm looking for a place that I'm going to start the next phase of my life in. Same thing when I had to make the time to actually do this research trip. I had to reschedule my clients or tell them that I was going to be away. I had to, you know, do uh, finish up projects that were almost done and carve out time when I wouldn't be taking on any more client work so that I could have this two weeks to like really dig into the city and figure out if it was going to work for me. So instead of trying to figure out something big like a relocation or quitting your job or writing a book in one sitting, break it down into bigger tasks with a higher cost but that still move you towards your goal. This is where most of us get stuck when we're trying to do a big thing, like quit a job or move to a new city or launch a product or whatever it is. We get stuck when we get to those high cost but high benefit steps. So when you take action and you buy that plane ticket, um, you're going to experience a huge surge of momentum that's going to power you through the process, giving you inspiration, energy, and a sense that this is all possible. 
And this is just because you've focused on your goal and you've taken some concrete action. You're also building the mental muscle needed to sustain attention on this project. So there's that key word again, attention, right? That we talked about before. So I know it sounds crazy, maybe even a stretch to say that something as simple as you know, a process like time mapping or the scales method, which is sort of a subsection of time mapping, can actually create momentum towards changing your life, but it can. And I know it can because I've experienced it. So now let's get to the other two categories, low cost and low benefit. I hate to break it to you guys, but email is not a priority and neither is that text that you just got. And this is probably where we have to really just work on breaking a habit, right? Because all of us are habituated, or I'd say most of us are habituated to getting that alert, <clears throat> that notification, and just going to it, right? Like the shiny object syndrome, SOS, SOS, oh my God, I just got a text or an email, SOS, I have to look at it. No, you don't. You don't have to look at it, all right? So low cost, low benefit. This combination should be your lowest priority. Give yourself five to 10 to 15 minutes to handle this task, or put these kinds of tasks in between valuable tasks as a useful break. Things that are in the low cost and low benefit category are probably necessary tasks like checking emails or responding to texts, but they don't contribute that much towards reaching your desired goal. Keep these way down your priority list. This is the hardest one to, to do, but when you do it, it makes the biggest difference. I mean, nowadays, I don't check my email except at the beginning of the day, the middle of the day, and the end of the day. That's on a really good day. On a really good day, I check my email three times a day. If I'm having a, a really crappy day and I'm distracted, I'm in my email like every 20 minutes. And you can even use how often you check email as a gauge for how much on task, how focused you are that particular day. Same thing with text messages, Instagram alerts, Facebook alerts. You can, do, uh, you can change the settings on your phone so that you are not alerted by apps. And I know that kind of takes out some of the immediacy of social media and there could be a case made for like responding immediately to keep things you know, going in your business or in your personal life. But most of this stuff can really wait. Email, text messages, notifications are more likely just going to get you off task and then you're going to get distracted and then you're going to have to recover from that distraction. And remember, when we're multitasking, it's harder to remember. So it's harder to remember not only what we were doing, but recover that awesome train of thought that we were on or even remember the content of whatever it is that we're involved in at the moment, whether it is that we're learning something or in a conversation with someone or even visiting a new location. So don't worry about the email. Don't worry about the text. That's high cost, but low benefit. You wanna do this stuff definitely last or put boundaries around it so that you do it during a break. Then we've also got, um, I'm sorry, that, that was low cost and low benefit, right? Emails, text messages, and that kind of stuff. Then we've got high cost and low benefit. So high cost, low benefit, this is still the scales technique that we're talking about. Review if these tasks are really necessary. Try to think of ways to reduce the cost if you decide that the completion of that task is absolutely required. These are usually things that <clears throat> have to get done, but that are really like time consuming and can get annoying because they're kind of mindless or repetitive. So for instance, things like checking and updating spreadsheets. There's probably an app for that. So look for ways to automate your processes so you don't have to do some of this mind-numbing task work that really doesn't have that much benefit, but that has to get done. And you might not even need to do it at all. So a smart maxim to remember, one that I repeat for myself often and which I try to get better at all the time, is do the stuff that you want to do the least first so long as it fits in with your scales priorities. So the stuff that you wanna do least you know, that might be something that's in that um, high cost and high benefit, like plunking down that money on that teacher training or on that plane trip, plane ticket to the city that you're about to investigate for a relocation. But once you get it out of the way, it's going to free up so much energy. 
So let's talk about decision fatigue. You may have heard of this term before, and it's getting confused by too many choices. Most of us at this time in our human history have experienced this. So why do we make unhealthy and unproductive choices even when we know we should do better or we could do better or we could make a more life-affirming and empowering choice? Why do we make the unhealthy or unproductive or just stuck in our old loops choice? If you ask people, a lot of people might say that they have a lack of willpower or they forgot or something like that. But research from Columbia University is beginning to reveal that willpower doesn't work that way. Actually, willpower is a muscle and the more that you exercise it, the stronger that it'll get. So if you don't do something that you know that would be good for you to do, like meditate, and you just say, oh, I just don't have the willpower or I just don't have the discipline to meditate every day. If you just start meditating every day and you do it for five days in a row, it's going to be that much more difficult to get yourself off that streak. That's why so many meditation apps these days have a streak, uh, a streak function built in, and it tells you how many days in a row you've meditated. For instance, very recently, just a little while ago, I meditated for 24 days in a row, which was the longest streak that I'd had in a really long time. And I, it, was, it happened in part because I was part of, part of an accountability group where every day we checked in with each other on our meditation and health and wellness and fitness um, goals. And then I broke that streak. And guess what? That was about three days ago and I haven't meditated since. So I need to build that back up again. It's amazing, but just one time um, coming off of that streak, and if I don't take action and meditate that very next day that I broke the streak, it's going to be harder for me to start up again. So that's willpower. Um, a recent, this is really, really interesting, and it's a little bit long, but just stay with me because this is kind of freaky, but I want to share this with you because it, is, it just shows you about... Um, about, about decision making and decision fatigue. So a research study that was published by the National Academy of Sciences, psychologists examined the factors that impacted whether or not a judge approved a criminal for parole. Researchers examined 1,112 judicial rulings over a 10 month period. All the rulings were made by a parole board judge who was determining whether or not to allow the criminal to be released from prison on parole. Now, you might assume that the judges were influenced by factors like the type of crime committed or the particular laws that were broken, but the researchers found exactly the opposite. The choices made by the judges were impacted by all types of things that shouldn't have an effect in the courtroom, most notably the time of day. What the researchers found was that at the beginning of the day, a judge was likely to give a favorable ruling about 65% of the time. However, as the day wore on and the judge became drained from making more and more decisions, the likelihood of a criminal getting a favorable ruling and getting out on parole steadily dropped to zero. After taking a lunch break, however, the judge would return to the courtroom refreshed and the likelihood of a favorable ruling would immediately jump back up to 65%. Then as the hours moved on in the second half of the day, the percentage of favorable rulings would fall back down to zero by the end of the day. This trend held true for more than 1,100 cases and it didn't matter what the crime was, murder, rape, theft, or embezzlement, a criminal was much more likely to get a favorable response and get out on parole if their hearing was scheduled in the morning or immediately after lunch. So the moral of the story is, if you're gonna commit a crime, make sure your trial's in the morning or after lunch. No, <laughs> that's not it. Um, as it turns out, willpower is like a muscle. And just like muscles in your body, willpower can get fatigued when you use it over and over again. Every time you make a decision, it's like going to the gym and doing another rep. And just to how, you're, like, how your muscles get tired at the end of a workout, the strength of your willpower fades as you make more decisions. Researchers refer to this phenomenon as decision fatigue. When a judge on a parole board experiences decision fatigue, 
they deny more parole requests. It makes sense, right? Your brain, your willpower is fading because your brain is tired of making decisions. It's easier to just say no and keep everybody locked up than it is to debate whether or not someone is trustworthy enough to leave prison. At the beginning of the day, those judges gave each case a fair shot, but as their energy started to fade, they just denied them. And here's why this is important for those of us that are trying to make good decisions and move forward in our lives. Because decision fatigue happens every day in our lives. When we have to decide between tackling this email or that text message or this project and there's all these decisions in front of us, it gets harder to make other decisions following that. So for example, everybody can probably relate to this. You had a particularly decision heavy day where you had to prioritize between this thing and the other thing. And then you come home and you're feeling drained. You might want to go to the gym and work out, but your brain would probably just default to the easy decision, sit on the couch. And that's decision fatigue. The same thing is true if you find it hard to muster up the willpower to work on your side project at night or to cook a healthy meal for dinner. So now we're going to talk about how we can combat some of this decision fatigue. And I just want to share this slide with you guys, and you guys are all get this presentation to watch again. Um, these are some of the ways that decision fatigue, having too many choices, can cause stress. All right, we have the reduced ability to make trade-offs, like if I complete this presentation, then I'm going to go to the gym. So instead of being able to like, you know, make a trade-off or something where we get into what's called decision paralysis, where we just can't make any decision at all. And then we start kind of like wilfing on our presentation. It doesn't really get done. And then we start doing impulsive decisions where we just make a decision, any decision, and that's impaired self-control. So how do we defeat decision fatigue? We can set time limits for ourselves. And I'm going to talk to you guys about that really soon. We can take a time out. I'm going to talk about that. You can delegate the decision. You can use checklists, making a list and limiting your choices. This is all time mapping, right? Limiting your choices, using checklists, making a list. This is all part of the time mapping stuff that I'm teaching you guys. And then the two that I starred are the ones that I really want to focus on for a second. Make decisions as a group. That's where group coaching comes into play. When you're involved in a group coaching program like the one that I'm involved in right now, and I have a coach and a buddy, and together as a triad, we help each other prioritize what are our most important decisions. I'm getting feedback from two other people who are really smart and have my best interests at mind and are also using a lot of these techniques that we're covering right now. So when I make decisions within a group setting and I trust those people, it just helps me get moving and it helps me clarify what's most important next. So make decisions as a group. That can happen in the coaching relationship. And then the other one is just decide. And this has been something that I've been doing more and more over the last few years of my life. Just decide. Stop thinking what if or maybe or if I do this, then I won't be able to do that. Just decide. Taking action, committing to something, it just creates such incredible momentum in your life and it frees you from this overwhelming decision fatigue. So next we're going to talk about how to tackle some of this decision fatigue that we're all experiencing in our lives these days. And I call it pick three. So this feeds right back into that time mapping exercise where you use the scales technique to figure out what are your most important priorities. So stop with the endless to-do list. I remember um, about a year ago, I was um, introduced to the concept of limiting your to-do list to 10 items. And I was like, no way, because my to-do lists were always like 50 items long and they just grew and grew and grew. And I was never able to mark things off my to-do list It just kept getting longer and longer. When I heard that I should limit my to-do list to 10 items, I just thought that that was crazy talk. And now I'm actually telling you guys to do three. Three items at once. Why? Because of decision fatigue. If you have a 10 item or a 20 item or a 50 item to-do list, how do you start? How do you start? Right? It's just easier to go on Instagram or Facebook. 
And you know, you'll say like, oh, I'll figure it out, but let me just go on Facebook for a second first, right? And that is a decision that many of us take over and over and over again. I know I've made that decision myself and it may not feel like a decision, right? But if we go back to this slide, it's that impaired self-control, it's that impulsive decision when we just can't decide, so we lose all self-control and we just go on Instagram or Facebook. So having three to-do items gives us a sense of control. Oh, I noticed that somebody is trying to chat with me, I think, but I am not sure if I'm able to check that chat. So I'm gonna do that in just a second. Um, okay, so yeah, pick three, pick three. Use the scales method and your weekly time mapping sheets to figure out your three top priorities. Now. When I have done this, it has helped me so much because the reason why I started looking into this time mapping thing in the first place was because I knew that every single day I was insanely busy. But if you asked me at the end of the day, Lola, what did you do today? I would not be able to tell you because I had no plan. I was just diving into my day and hoping that I hit the right tasks in the right order. And Sometimes I would get things done. Sometimes I wouldn't get things done, but more often I would just be felt, I would just be left feeling overwhelmed, exhausted, and working like 12 and 14 hour days. Now I'm self-employed. So sometimes I would start my day at eight in the morning and I wouldn't be done until 10 at night. That would be actually a pretty average day for me before I started doing this time mapping thing. And I'm sure many of you who are entrepreneurs and who are self-employed can relate to this, like starting at eight and ending at 10 or sometimes even later. And it sounds crazy, but we acclimate to that and we start getting used to that, but it has a really, really, like it's just not sustainable. And I believe that part of the reason why I actually got injured in the first place was because I was just doing that kind of life for way, way, way too long and I was not getting enough rest. So pick three, pick three. Sounds like the lottery ticket, pick three. Pick three things and do those first and you'll feel an incredible sense of accomplishment. You'll generate momentum. And when somebody asks you what you did, you'll actually be able to remember because you decided before you started your day, what were the three most important things? And you figured out what the three most important things were because you applied these time mapping techniques and you recognized and decided and figured out what were the steps that were going to get you closest to your ultimate goal. All right, so that is um, the things that we just talked about, time mapping and the scales technique and pick three are the methods that I've used for starting to get control over my day-to-day -day existence and over my work. And my work is what feeds my ultimate life dream, right? Like my dream is to be totally time and location independent, where I can work from anywhere in the world. I can work as much as I want to, or I can work as little as I want to. And most importantly, that my life, that there's enough time in my life for life, for being with my partner, for being in nature, for doing yoga, for dancing, for cooking, for having a garden, for reading, for napping, for being with my family, for all of those important things that are always the things that we, um, that we don't do first when we feel under time pressure. Also very important for me is that I create a life that feels that, that feels in line with why I'm here in this lifetime, on this planet, in this incarnation. I know I'm here to help people feel excited about their lives and to feel that their lives have meaning, right? My, I know that one of, the, one of my big dharmas is to live a life with meaning. And part of the way that I derive meaning from life is to help other people feel that they're living with meaning and purpose. So if my life purpose is to help other people live their life purpose, we all need to be on point and we need to have like, we need to figure out what our purpose is and how to live it. So 
all of this time mapping, it's like, how does time mapping, which sounds almost like, I don't know, corporate-y or um, executive speak or something like that, it may not sound that inspiring, but it's a step that actually can help us live out our purpose. That may sound like a stretch, but I'm telling you that it is absolutely the truth. And I know it's the truth because as I've been implementing time mapping, I'm getting closer and closer to living the life of my dreams and living out my purpose. So I just want to say that again, a technique like this, time mapping, the scales technique for prioritization, pick three, all of these techniques that I'm sharing with you today are actually tools that help us live our life purpose. And if you don't believe me right now, today, that's okay. But I know that this is true. And that's why I'm online today sharing this stuff with you. So let's talk about some mindset, mindset shifts for defeating distraction. So distraction is going to happen, right? Your phone is going to go off and just reflexively, you're going to look at it and then you're going to get distracted. Even even today, as I'm doing this time mapping stuff and I'm implementing these techniques in my own life, I still get distracted. I get distracted a lot, but it's getting better. I know that it's getting better because my ability to focus is getting stronger and my ability to deny the distraction is, is getting stronger. If I hear an alert on my phone or I get a pop-up on my computer telling me I have an email, I'm better able to not pay attention. So let's talk about mindset shifts. Like how did I get to that place, right? How did I get from being completely dominated by the notifications on my phone to being able to effectively ignore them? So the first and most important step I would say is to exercise willpower. Just keep exercising that willpower, right? We talked about decision fatigue. And when you have a thousand and one things to decide from, it's hard to make any decision at all. We talked about how once you become interrupted, right, that, that sort of wolfing thing, what was I looking for? It's harder to remember what you were doing in the first place, or it's harder to remember the content of whatever you were engaged with at that time, that important conversation with your partner or the book that you were reading or the webinar that you were on. So exercising willpower, remember, it gets stronger the more that you use it. So if you are able to just deny yourself looking at your Instagram because you see that you got a notification that somebody commented on it, the first time that you're able to not look, you're going to feel like, like a superhero. You're just going to be like, oh my God, I cannot believe that I was able to actually deny myself the instant gratification of seeing what somebody wrote on my Instagram. And let me tell you another really fun thing. Maybe that is not your like distraction drug du jour, but um, since many of us are on Instagram and love it when people comment on our feeds, I have found over time that like the payoff that I get from looking at somebody's comment on my Instagram isn't as great as it was the first time that it happened. So the first time that people commented on my Instagram feed, I was like, oh my God, people are actually talking on my feed. <laughs> they're commenting, they're liking. And now that I'm able to deny myself that instant gratification, when I do check the comments, I'm able to not only sort of see them as a whole and take that in as a whole, as far as the comments on any particular thing that I may have, may have posted, but not responding to them in the moment, I realize that I actually feel better when I'm focused and I actually feel better getting things done and moving towards my purpose than being distracted by a like or a comment on Instagram, right? Like it feels so much better to be aligned with your purpose than it does to be distracted and checking out your Instagram feed, but it just takes a little while for that shift to take place. So exercise willpower, just try it. And the more that you do it, the better that it's going to get. Use your time mapping sheets. I am going to be sending these to you in a follow-up email. Use them. It will take a little time to get used to it, but it works. Okay. Five behavioral shifts. Here we go. Plan your decisions the week before and review them 
the night before or the morning of. So I plan, as I mentioned, I plan on Sunday nights and then I review every day's tasks or priorities that I've set for that day, the night before and the morning of. Use the scales method and do the important and lowest cost stuff first. You'll feel a sense of accomplishment and generate momentum that'll keep you going. Number three, stop making decisions and start making commitments. This is time mapping. Again, when you see what's in your plan and you stick to it and you know the consequences for not doing it because you lose that alignment with your purpose and your dream life that you want to live starts looking a little bit further and further away. Number four, if you have to make good decisions later in the day, eat something first. Remember that story about the judges and they were more likely to grant parole to criminals if it was early in the morning or after lunch. So if you need to really weigh something out, like maybe you're having an important conversation or you need to make a decision for your business and it involves some of that like moral or, or ethical or financial weighing of options, do that when you're rested. Don't try to do it after you've had like a bang on day. And number five, simplify. Improve your output by reducing the number of inputs. Again, this is one of the hardest steps. And this is also where coaching can be of huge, huge help. I'm going to say that again. Improve your output by reducing the number of inputs. This is when you just, again, using the example of your phone where you do not... Um, allow your phone to send you notifications where you actually turn those off. And the way coaching can help you with this is by having that accountability structure in place where you know that later that week, you're going to have a call with your coach or with your buddy and they're going to ask you, hey, how's it going with that thing that you said was really important to you? They're going to help keep you on task. All right. And the last thing on this slide is the Pomodoro technique. And the Pomodoro technique is named after those um, old school tomato timers, which were called Pomodoros. I guess that was the name of the company that made them. And so Pomodoro can help you through distractions, helps you hyper-focus and get things done in short bursts while taking frequent breaks to come up for air and relax. Best of all, it's really easy. So the methodology is simple. When faced with any large task or series of tasks, Break the work down into short timed intervals called pomodoros that are spaced out by short breaks. This trains your brain to focus for short periods and helps you stay on top of deadlines or um, constantly moving targets. And with time, it even helps you improve your attention span and concentration. I can absolutely attest to this. Since I've been doing pomodoros, I am able to focus for consistently for whatever time period I set, and then I take my break. So Pomodoro is a cyclical system. You work in short sprints, which makes sure that you're constantly productive. And you also get to take regular breaks that bolster your motivation and keep you creative. So the classic Pomodoro is a 25-minute sprint followed by a five-minute break. But the one that I've been using lately is the Beast Mode Pomodoro. And that is a 52-minute sprint followed by a 17-minute break. Now, 17 minutes is a pretty good long period of time. So if I work for 52 minutes and then I get a 17-minute break, I can wash all the dishes in my sink. I can take my dog out to pee. I can meditate. I can do a lot of push-ups, right? There's a lot you can do in 17 minutes. I can take a shower and get dressed and be ready. So 52 minutes, 17-minute break, that's been... Um, a cycle that's been working awesome for me. But I invite you to start with the classic Pomodoro 25 minute sprint with a five minute break. And the part about um, that, that Pomodoros help you build your ability to focus and concentrate is absolutely true, right? It's a little bit like meditation. The more often that you meditate and the longer that you do it for, the more you'll be able to sustain attention. And that's what this is all about, guys, is sustaining attention. So here's something really important. It's important to note that a Pomodoro is an indivisible unit of work. That means if you get distracted partway through your Pomodoro, you need to either end it or start a new one later. All right, so you, if you get distracted in the middle of your Pomodoro, just end it. Don't try to like deal with a distraction and then come back and finish the Pomodoro. So that also helps keep you accountable and on task. 
All right, so back to our friends. Oh, no, we're still, we're still here on tools for obliterating overwhelm. Okay, so this is really quick. So these are some of the online tools that I use, right? Egg timer. Egg timer, you put in the um, interval of time that you want to work, and it runs in the background, and when time's up, it tells you, and then you do your break. Recess. Now, Recess is an awesome app for Mac. I'm not sure if it's available for PC, but I know it's available for Mac. And it runs in your taskbar, and I have mine set at my 5217 Pomodoro. So when I, um, when I turn on my computer, Recess starts automatically, and it starts counting down for 52 minutes. At 52 minutes, it literally takes over my screen. Like, it literally puts a, a black box over my whole entire screen with a button in the middle that says, that shows my 17-minute countdown. So, recess is awesome because basically if you, um, it just takes over your whole desktop and forces you to take a break. Now, of course, you can hit um, ignore which I've done sometimes, but that's kind of not the point. You really want to get in the habit of doing these 52-minute sprints followed by 17-minute breaks or whatever interval you have. So Recess app is awesome. Check it out. Download it. It runs in the taskbar. Focusatwill.com is one of my absolute most favorite and beloved websites. It is scientifically researched music for engaging in focus. There's all different types of music. And you can take a quiz to figure out what type of um, what type of distraction or what how, what your mental sort of habits are. So, for instance, um, after I took that quiz, it told me to um, use a certain channel on Focus at Will that was a certain type of music that helped me focus. And I've used a bunch of different channels, and I've found one that really works for me. But I have Focus at Will also set up for a 52-minute interval. So my Recess app is counting down 52 minutes. Focus at Will is uh, counting down 52 minutes. And I'm listening to Focus at Will in my noise-canceling headphones. So I'm getting this stream of music that's being put into my uh, headphones that is helping me concentrate. And there's a whole bunch of literature on Focus at Will that explains how and why this music helps you concentrate, but let me just say that it does. I don't know how it does, I can't really remember how it does, but it works because once I started using Focus at Will, I was able to get to that 52 minute Pomodoro and stay focused the entire time and ignore all those distractions, pop ups, notifications, etc. Noise canceling headphones help because you might not hear that alert that goes off on your phone. And then of course, meditation is one of the most important tools for obliterating overwhelm. Because the more we meditate, the more we're able to focus, right? Meditation is sustained attention, sustained attention to your breath or to a mantra or to whatever technique that you use in meditation. Meditation is training our attention training and concentration. And here's our friends, the time police. So none of this works, guys, unless you work it, right? you got to work the plan for the magic to work. And distractions are going to happen, right? But the way that you deal with that is just by concentrating your attention, right? Building your resolve using that willpower to say like, hey, I got distracted, but I'm going to get back on it. And in the beginning, you're going to feel like you can't concentrate or you're getting distracted easily and don't worry about it. Your willpower, your decision to do this is over time going to make that part of your brain stronger than the part of your brain that says, I can't focus. I'm too distractible. I have ADHD. So the more that you build this muscle by actually doing it, the bigger and stronger that part of your brain gets. And the part of your brain that says that you can't, the more that that gets like defanged, right? And pretty soon you're going to feel like you have so much more control over your day. So build your focus by doing this every day and it will get stronger. Be in a community of people who are working on their personal life, productivity, figuring out their dharma, living with purpose and generally slaying life, right? So coaching is one way that you do that because you're in a group of people who all want the same things and are all looking for that enhanced life and living in, with purpose. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. 
So um, I'm going to send you all of these um, tools that I mentioned in this webinar in a follow-up email. And I'm also going to send you a link to replay this if you would like to listen to this again. Since many of you who are on this webinar are friends of mine or are coaching um, buddies of mine, I would really, really appreciate some feedback from you guys if you listen to this webinar because um, I, I would just love to know how it, how it went for you and any uh, suggestions or feedback that you have for me. All right, so we are nearing the end of this webinar. Want to leave you with this awesome quote. So he, he who every morning plans the transaction of the day and follows out that plan carries a thread that will guide him through the maze of the most busy life. But where no plan is laid, where the disposal of time is surrendered merely to the chance of incidents, chaos will soon reign. Obviously, this was written a long time ago because it's he and, you know, there could be she's or z's or they's on this webinar. But I just left the quote the way that it came from Victor, oops, and that's a typo. It should say Victor Hugo who's the author of Les Miserables and the Hunchback of Notre Dame. And I think it's so funny because like when we are feeling um, totally chaotic and when we're feeling like, you know, we're just in this chaos because our time management is just not non-existent, we feel miserable. <laughs> and we sometimes look like hunchbacks sitting at our desks, banging it out, trying to get it done because we didn't really plan our time very well. All right, so guys, that is the end of the webinar. I'm going to see if anybody, oh, somebody chatted at me. How exciting. Oh my gosh, Audrey Gebhardt. I don't know if you're still here, but she just texted that, or she chatted that uh, she opened Instagram one of the many times when I was talking about how Instagram is one of those distractions that can get us. So I realized that I have gone 15 minutes over the allotted time for this webinar. I'm truly, um, I am, I am, I have to, let me phrase this the correct way. I acknowledge that I went 15 minutes over the allotted time for this webinar and I am committed to getting better about staying within the hour. So thank you guys so much if you stayed here this entire time. I really, really appreciate you being here. I'd love to hear from you, any feedback that you have on this webinar and please look out for all of the tools that are coming in a follow-up. So if you signed up for this webinar, you were automatically entered into a drawing to win totally completely free my uh, attendance in my debut eight-week coaching program. I haven't set the dates yet, but it's coming soon. It's probably going to start in September. And so if you signed up for this webinar, you are um, in that drawing to get that for free because I'm really excited about launching my first coaching program and I want to get people into it and I want people to feel like it's accessible. It's, there is going to be a big discount offered to those of you who were on this webinar because you guys are like the first people to actually be with me online and um, learn from me in this new way of that I have of delivering um, my knowledge and my life experience and all the things that I have studied for myself. Um, and now I can share those with you guys. But I, for some of those of you who have, you know, taken yoga with me or been my students or learned from me on retreat, I'm moving to this online space. And so those of you who are there with me from the very beginning, I want to offer you an awesome discount to join my program. Uh, because this is new for all of us. This is going to be my first time teaching online virtually, and it's different. It's different than being with you in person. So um, I really, really appreciate your attention, and thank you so much for being here with me today. I'm going to send you all of this stuff in an email soon, and together we can 